Today's reading is from Luke chapter 24, verse 13 to 35. Uh, I will give you time to find the passage. It will also be displayed behind me. Luke chapter 24, verse 13 to 35. On the road to Emmaus. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it was just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did you not know the Messiah had to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while we talked with us on the road? And opened the scriptures to us. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them, assembled together and saying, It is true, The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two were the two told what had happened on the way, and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Thanks, Jonathan. Why don't I pray for us and then we'll open the passage. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for the honesty that there is in Scripture, that um, there are people who are despondent, downcast, um, disappointed with situations and disappointed in life, and yet you engage them where they are. You help them to see how you are a good God and what you have done. And so, God, we pray today, um, whilst we could be distracted by so many other things, would you help us to uh, be expectant, help us to engage with you, help us as we hear your word and as we think about it to Um, encounter you and to see your goodness. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So we are in the final sermon of Meals with Jesus, and it's been looking through the book of Luke and all the different meals and and the way in which they, they have shown us something of the relationship with Jesus. And you might be thinking as we've gone through them, well, it's all great that these disciples got to engage with God. But I've been having a pot noodle at home in front of the TV. I felt socially isolated and hadn't been able to engage with people as much. The idea of getting around a table and having food together is the sort of stuff that's just not possible right now. Being close to God, being close to others doesn't feel like something that 
I have experienced. You might look at this passage and see Jesus being gentle and kind and helping some people who feel down realize that he is good. You might be like, that, that's, that's just not my experience right now. I don't know about you, but one of the things that I love reading in the Bible is the beginning in Genesis, where it implies that Adam walked with, G- with God in the cool of the day. And I just often think, how amazing would that be to, to just be with God, to, to be with the creator of all things and to enjoy him in the cool of the day. And then as I've spoken to some of you, as I've got the opportunity to just pray with some of you, it feels like for many of us, that's the furthest from our experience. We're praying at the moment and it feels a bit tough, a little bit dry. We try to engage with the word, but it it, it feels a little bit more difficult. And the idea that God would walk with us comfortably in the cool of the day and that he would feel close to us in in that way just doesn't feel real for us. God feels distant and maybe we're feeling kind of tough right now. Well, this passage speaks right into that. The last bit in Luke contains three stories about Jesus' resurrection. And in the next book, Luke writes that Jesus has been with the disciples for 40 days. That is a lot longer than three stories. That is reams of books, perhaps perhaps libraries of books, of stories about Jesus engaging with people. Yet there's only three that he includes in this chapter, which even means Luke is the most harshest editor ever, or they show us something about the character of God, about the resurrected God and how we engage with him. We're gonna see some of that today, how it could help us be filled with hope and celebrate. And hopefully by the end of it, we won't feel, oh, wouldn't it be great to be able to be like Adam and walk with God in the cool of the day? Wouldn't it be good to be able to have Jesus with us and and watch him break bread and see the emotion on his face, but we would know that we can know God now and we can engage with him. So we've got three points from this passage. Number one will be Jesus walks with us through disappointment. Number two will be Jesus is known through the word. And number three will be Jesus is known through community. Let me take us to point number one. Jesus walks with us through disappointment. Um, If you turn your Bibles and have a look at verses 13 to 24, you'll see two disciples, one clear person and another one unnamed. And the best way to describe them is downcasts, maybe sulking, maybe a bit overwhelmed with the world. They expected Jesus to lead their people out of bondage and slavery and to overthrow Roman rule. And here they are on a road that feels dodgy, but they describe as not the sort of place you'd want to walk at night, being downcast and overwhelmed. It's, it's almost a picture of how we might feel sometimes, that we are hoping that God might do something that we have asked for. And when it doesn't happen, we find ourselves walking away, feeling disappointed, feeling sad. Um, and notice that Jesus comes to speak with them. But Jesus is kind and a bit gentle to begin with. He doesn't start with what he's achieved. Although Jesus has just been raised from the grave, he's accomplished the most greatest moment in history far greater than something that might happen this evening. You might talk about this evening for your kids to come, but this is the greatest one in history that everybody would wanna talk about going forward. And yet Jesus doesn't go, you guys don't get it. What, this is what has happened. He asks them, why, what's going on with you? Why are you so downcast? Isn't that encouraging for us that we feel somewhat similar, that we, Although we know that Jesus has risen from the grave, although we know that he has saved us, we still face these effects of sadness. We still live in bodies that experience sin, sadness, and deep, deep pain. Our worlds have not been entirely renewed. We have not yet received our resurrection bodies that it talks about in Romans 8. And Christ has not yet wiped away every tear. Instead, we live in what feels like the road to Emmaus, a godless, God-forsaken world which ignores Jesus and views us as perhaps stupid and irrelevant. Here's the really encouraging bit. This risen God who's conquered all sin and death planned it this way. He is sovereign and he controls all things. And he was able to use the worst moment in history, the death of an innocent God-man, for the greatest moment in history, us being able to be redeemed by him. And he uses our pain whether it is 
caused by us or by others. He uses our sin. He uses the wrong in the world, and he's able to shape it for some purpose and some good. That is hugely encouraging. Or Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 1. He tells us the glory, the wisdom, and the power of Christ is seen in the shame, the weakness, and the foolishness of the cross. What this means is when we experience pain and sadness, Jesus can use that for good. And when we put our trust in him, we do not walk alongside other people who are struggling going, oh, I used to feel like that, but now, I mean, huh, holiness with God is pretty good. No, we, we go with struggles. We go with honesty. We go knowing that we are fellow human beings, fellow sufferers, fellow sinners, and we walk along talking about how great and how kind our God is. He walks with us through our disappointments. But Jesus doesn't do that. Second point um, in chapter, verses 25 to 30 is he, we, we know Jesus through his word. Again, isn't that kind of encouraging to us that the disciples know their Bibles incredibly well, and yet Jesus is standing right with them, walking with them, and they don't recognize him for who he is. The scriptures say that they are kept from recognizing him. But yet, if you go further on in Revelation, Jesus is described as this resurrected God who has a face so bright it is like the sun, a voice so deep and commanding it is like 10,000 voices at once. Jesus could have gone, do you not get it? I have done the greatest thing in history. But they don't recognize him at all. It's not that the disciples don't care. They want Jesus to be there, but they They only start to encounter him, start to see who Jesus is when the scriptures are read. And did you notice, it's not just that the Bible is read, but we see what? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. That little bit there is really helpful for us. Another way to look at it is that all the scriptures were about him. Not just that we get good Bible knowledge, that we interpret it rightly, that all of this hope, all of this history is about what Christ has achieved at the cross. Now, I can't see all of your faces because you've got masks on, but I can kind of, now that we've got into this for a little while, get quite good at reading your eyes. Nobody's going, what? That's completely new information. But there's a couple of application points you should probably think about. Number one is, if this is true, if their hearts only started to burn once Jesus showed them the word, then there's something for us to think about. And the first is that the word is key for changing hearts. If the post-resurrection Jesus wasn't one that couldn't cause them to see you clearly, it was only through the opening of the word, then that is a really encouraging for us as a church. Because what that means is no fancy language, no, no great knowledge, no amazing band, as wonderful as you guys are, no great videos, good job you guys, nothing will convince people how wonderful Jesus is, except for the opening of the word and the exposing of Christ in there. I mean, I don't know about you, but this week, when all this stuff is going on with with England, I I caught myself slipping into this. I caught myself reading about how Raheem Sterling and Saka were talking about their Christian faith, and I was like, oh, wouldn't it be mint if they were just in our church and they could just tell everybody about how great God is? That would give gospel opportunities. Well, yeah, maybe that would get people in through the door. But we believe that nothing but the word of God being opened, Christ being shown to us, will cause them to cross the line of faith. And we need to hold on to that when we are tempted to put our hope in anything else. It is only in the word that hearts can be changed. But application point number two would be that the word needs to be a priority in our lives. Look at these disciples. They highly value the word. They know it really, really deeply but they've misinterpreted it. They've got distracted. Go back a couple of chapters in Luke to chapter 10 when there's the story of Mary and Martha. They both are inviting Jesus into their home and and Mary sits at at Jesus' feet and Martha's busy doing stuff and getting stuff done. Somebody that we would call like a hustler, it's really good, she's doing things. And Jesus rebukes her for being distracted. He uses that word being anxious. The point being that Martha is distracted from God by her anxieties. Would you notice that this is a woman who is not an enemy of God? This is not a woman who has no interest in Jesus. She is one who calls him Lord, who has invited him into her house. 
but she's too distracted by everything else to see the priority of sitting at the word and having that impact her life. Now, hear me right. I am not saying that means that you need to only prioritize the word of God. Please, this week, if you have children, don't go. You need to feed yourself. Um, I'm going to do some quiet time. I'll be back in 20 minutes. That is not what I'm implying at all. But to be practical, it does mean that if we have an eternal perspective, if we engage with the word regularly, if our eyes are turned towards the goodness of God, then we will still deal with what is urgent but we will also not be gripped by it. We will not be distracted by it away from God. That's the point here, that the word becomes a priority in our lives. Finally, one more application point because of how this has opened is that the word should speak over our values and our expectations. We see how the disciples had wanted Jesus to be a certain type of God and king. They wanted him to set them free from Roman rule. They wanted him to fulfill the scriptures in the way that they'd seen it. But we know and we believe that the word should speak over us, not us speaking over the word. But it's so easy for us to slip into that, isn't it? It's a challenge for us as Christians. In fact, it's a challenge for even non-Christians because you have to believe in something. You have to have some sort of higher moral code. And if you don't, then actually, if science is your only highest value, then you find yourself being quite inconsistent. You find yourself making bigger leaps of faith, I would submit, than even the Christians in this room. Um, there's a writer called Rebecca McLaughlin, in, and she writes in Confronting Christianity this, if we are no more than the features that can be described by science, and our only story is the evolutionary story, we have no grounds for insisting on human equality, protection of the weak, equal treatment of women, or any other ethical treatment we hold dear. To cite one example among thousands, female primates are routinely sexually assaulted by males. And to say that that behavior is wrong for humans, that it should be vigorously resisted and rigorously punished despite its evolutionary advantages, is to say that humans are distinct from other creatures at a fundamental level. See, whether you believe that there's a God or not, we all act as though there is good and evil, that there is right and wrong, that there should be human rights, that people are of incredible value. It's just that if you are a Christian, it seems a bit more consistent because you're getting that from the word of God telling us that that is the case. But if science is your only value, then it becomes really hard, doesn't it? It's like an incredible leap of faith to go, actually, there's nothing. It means nothing. Death is nothing but we should treat people equally. Um, I do not like oppression. I do not like racism. Well, actually, they just become mental constructs that you make up. It is the word of God that gives us clarity in the world. And it's the word of God that helps us to see Christ, that helps us to engage with him. Final point, Jesus isn't just known through his word. He is known through community. Do you see that in the last few verses? that it's at the moment in which they're breaking bread that their eyes are cleared and they recognize Jesus for who he is. This bit of the passage is pointing back to the feeding of the 5,000. It's pointing back to um, a time, because there's similarities there, where in both stories, it's happening at the end of the day. In both stories, people are misunderstanding who Jesus are. And in the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus breaks bread and reveals himself as the Messiah. In this passage, Jesus breaks bread and reveals himself as the suffering servant who's risen from the grave. How does that become clear for the disciples? It's through community. As soon as they hear the word and have their hearts burning within them, as soon as bread is broken and the word is embodied in a meal, the disciples match up the word and meal immediately. They get it. And it's at that point that Jesus disappears. It tells us how important those two things are together, the word of God and community. Now, hear me, community is incredibly important, but it's just hard work, isn't it? Because community is annoying. It's got annoying people like you and it's got annoying people like me. It's got annoying people like these two sulking guys in the Bible who are just walking along the road with their lips pouting out and unhappy. It, 
it's, it's hard work. It requires us to engage with each other. It requires, requires us sometimes to, especially if you're an introvert, just gather something up in yourself and be ready to, to meet with people and to share with them. There are a million excuses why we don't want to do community. And yet this is highly valued here. The other thing is in community, when we, when we do this well, when we sacrifice for each other, when we love each other, when we point each other towards Christ, we get a glimpse of of heaven coming to earth. We get a glimpse of the presence of God. We get a glimpse of this greater meal that we'll someday enjoy. We'll get a glimpse of how things should be. That, that picture of Jesus wiping our tears away. Let me tell you and give you an example of how this looks like in our church. Um, the past few weeks, we've been reading through some forms and, and I was reading one and, and it just broke me to tears. Now hear me, I'm not very emotional and I definitely don't start reading forms and generally cry. I don't like sign to, up to iTunes and find myself going, beautiful, it's, it's not something I usually do. But we've done the Finding Your Story series recently and, and one of the questions on that was just, how could you as a church member use your history to, 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 to help the church if you feel comfortable? I, and I want to be really careful, I don't want to um, give away any um, details of anyone in particular but as you as we read along that line as I myself personally got the privilege of being to, to see and pray for people through that it was gut-wrenching and incredibly encouraging that people were willing to use the difficulty of facing death in a family member their personal trauma their mental health their fertility issues and perhaps even their miscarriages eating disorders, their, their marital strife and divorce and their suicidal thoughts. And they were willing to use all of it to encourage other church members, to point them towards Christ, to get us to grow as a family. There is no reason for that to happen beyond the great work of what Jesus has done at the cross, that we would sacrifice, that we'd go through deep pain like that for each other. It is a great picture of God's care for us. This type of community reveals the heart and the care of Christ. And it's what we encourage and it's what we value. But can I say also, it's something that's tough. But when it happens, we do get a picture of, of the kingdom of God breaking out. That was so wonderful and lovely. Can I just take a moment here to talk a bit about this going forward as well? As a church, we're going to run, connect and equip in a different way going forward. We're going to have equip as a midweek track that people are going to have to jump into and, and learn and, and apply to their lives. And we're going to have connect at the tail end of a week where you can gather together, share a meal, and hopefully interact together. And the hope here is not that you would see Sunday when the Bible is taught and uh, midweek equip as your learning time, and then your, your weekend community time and connect is the time when you get together and chat and spend time together. And that's it. You know, this is your community time. This is your word time. Off you go for the rest of, of your life. We have prayed as elders for you guys for a chunk of time. And the hope is that these two things, community and the word, would be meshed together in our church so that we might see Christ all the more. So that we might want to worship him and lean on him. My, my hope and my prayer is that as we walk in on a Wednesday or a Thursday evening, before we come to equip, our brains aren't thinking, oh, I hope the food's decent. Our brains aren't thinking, oh, I hope my track will teach me something well. But that we might even gr grab our connect teams together, our, our, our groups together and go, why don't we do a quick prayer walk through our city? And why don't we pray for the people who are teaching us? And why don't we come expectant that God might change our hearts and teach us something if he is sovereign, that we could encourage each other as a church and grow? My hope is then that when we go to our community groups and we're, we're doing Connect Together, that we're not just breaking bread, but we're thinking about what Matt or Ralph or whoever has preached during on the Sunday and we're trying to live it out and apply it to our lives. And we're being honest, like the guys on the road to Emmaus and the ways that we struggle and don't do that right. That would be a wonderful community that would picture Christ, that would be centered around him, that would not be walking as though they are perfect, nor wallowing in self-pity, but knowing that we are fellow strugglers, sufferers in Christ, and trying our best to walk with him, knowing that someday he will wipe away all of our tears. But right now, we follow him. We pick up our crosses. We have tears to shed. That's why he's coming back to wipe away our tears. And as we go through them, we do it as a Christian community so we can point other people. We can show and reveal 
Jesus to get to hit two others around here. Final bit. So lots of chat here about meals. What are meals for? Well, first point is, do you know what's really exciting? Jesus, once he's resurrected, once he has his new body, he's still eating. At least that's really exciting for me because I, I love food. Um, it means that we're going to get to enjoy wonderful, good food in heaven. I don't know what that will be. Maybe it will be pot noodles, maybe not. I, that's not the point that's here. But what we do know is that we will be enjoying meals together. And, and that for the meantime, meals give us a glimpse into what it's like to live under God's grace. They express the community Jesus chose to die for. They actually, hopefully, will encourage and embolden that community as they break bread together. We saw even last week that meals allow us to take a moment to just slow down and remind our hearts of how good and kind God is and his sacrifice that he has made. And meals give us a foretaste of heaven, especially when it's a good meal, of the new creation. We, but the thing is, we don't have meals for any of these reasons. It's a trick question. Meals, in fact, everything, everything, that has ever existed, everything that's created, everything that has happened is for a greater purpose. Since sin entered the world, Jesus came and he, sorry, God came and he set up a nation. Um, Jesus came and was born and, and, and suffered and died for our sake. He broke bread for us and, and the gospel went out around the world and it came to Manchester and we've seen churches planted and all of that is so that we might be able to together enjoy a meal before Christ at some point in the future. That we will sit with him in his presence and enjoy him, not as just nervous employees, not as just servants, but as ones loved by him. That we wouldn't just long to walk in the cool of the day with God. That we wouldn't just long to have some level of closeness like the disciples did, but that we would sit with him at a table as invited guests, as loved children of God, and we would celebrate, and we would feast forever. It is that picture which drives us to community. It's what drives us to engage with the word. It is what drives us to plant churches. It is what drives us to be sacrificial and be willing to serve one another, even though it's incredibly painful. Everything exists so that someday this will take place, and it's a wonderful picture for us to look forward to. We have meals because God loves us. Let me pray, and we'll respond. Father, we thank you that as we look towards you, our eyes are turned towards how things will be, a future celebration, a future banquet that is greater than we could ever imagine. But Lord, we also want to recognize that right now, things are far from perfect. There are people in this room who are struggling with a, a, a bucket load of different problems. And, and Lord, we join in with the disciples on the road to Emmaus walking in disappointment and ask you to turn our eyes towards you. We ask you to be kind and patient with us. We ask you to empower us to pick up our crosses to follow you. And we ask you by the power of your word and with the help of the community that you have loved and chosen to die for, would you help us to engage, to love you and to love one another. It's in your name we pray. Amen.